Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Gamma Ray live stream. We are here with one brunch to save the world. Uh, I'm Rick Jacobs. I'm a producer at Skybound. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Skybound's a multi-platform entertainment company. We do lots of cool stuff in publishing and games and film and TV. Uh, we do The Walking Dead, amongst other many, many, many fun, cool uh, projects. So. Uh, this is a this one brunch to save the world is a partnership between us and the Science and Entertainment Exchange, which is one of my favorite organizations working in Hollywood. Uh, it's a program of the National Academy of Sciences. They've done over 2,400 consults, including Wrinkle in Time, Black Panther, Big Hero Six. They've done over 250 <coughs> live events, primarily in New York and Los Angeles. Um, it's a great organization that focuses on making sure that all of us in Hollywood have our science right. Uh, I'm joined by a lot of really, really, really brilliant people and excited to have this conversation today. Uh, uh, on my far right, uh, Jessica Kale, who's a psychopharmacologist at Pepperdine University. Um, sitting next to her is uh, Kira Snyder, who's one of my favorite writers working in Hollywood. <laughs> She's a co-exec producer on The Handmaid's Tale. And uh, Amelia to my right, Ricardo Gil de Costa, did I pronounce that right? Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. um, who's a neuroscientist and founder and CEO of Neuroverse Inc. Um, I'm going to throw it to Kira first. She's going to talk a little bit about the conversations that we've all been having for a few days. And, um, and uh, yeah, jump in from there. Yeah, so one brunch to save the world. Uh, the, the topic that uh, we're all going to be talking about today is uh, brain enhancement and cognitive aug augmentation and the mind-body connection. Uh, so the three of us had a phone call earlier in the week, and I got a bit of a download of the amazing research uh, that they both do. Uh, and from that, um, I've developed basically a, a, a pitch for the future. Um, this isn't necessarily um, a movie or a miniseries. It's more of a sort of a fictional narrative um, uh, about uh, where we might be in the future with some of the research that's going on today. Uh, so this is Project Phoenix is the title. And just to set the stage, it's a few hundred years from now. Space travel is routine. Uh, there are shipyards in orbit. Ships uh, that are solar powered just leave from orbit. Uh, and not only is it routine, but it's encouraged because Earth is basically on the edge of ecological and social collapse. Uh, so people are leaving voluntarily um, all the time to settle new planets. Uh, project Phoenix is one of these missions. It is a humanitarian scientific project led by uh, Dr. Sophie Elliott, who is a neuroscientist, and Dr. Mason George, who is a nanotech expert working in the medical field. And the funding comes from uh, a woman named Eliza Murphy, who is a billionaire tech industrialist. And so they are putting together a project to send a ship and several hundred colonists to an uninhabited Earth-like planet to basically start over. Um, the planet has a long, numerical, forgettable designation, but uh, the team for Project Phoenix just calls it Springfield. Uh, that, that every state in the Union has a town named Springfield. We might as well have one in space. So they're <laughs> off to Springfield. Uh, so the colonists who are selected for Project Phoenix are not exactly who you might expect for this kind of thing. Uh, these are people who uh, have mental or physical illness, uh, who are elderly, are recovering from addiction, and they will be traveling along with their families. Uh, these are people who have been on Earth uh, institutionalized or over-medicated, uh, really with little improvement to their condition. Uh, but Sophie and Mason, our scientists, they have a different idea. So, But by healing and enhancing these people's minds and bodies, they can create a new and better world, literally mind over matter. Uh, the project is named not after the town in Arizona. It's named for the mythological bird who regenerates and rises from its own ashes. Uh, the motivations of our team are also quite personal. So Sophie's father, a former farmer, um, has Alzheimer's, and Mason's son is uh, recovering from opiate addiction. Uh, Eliza, her daughter, is, uh, is a, um, a warfighter veteran with severe PTSD. Uh, so people on Earth uh, are actually kind of happy to see them go. You know, these are people that, that Earth has seen wrongly as a drain on resources and starting a colony with these people, like no one thinks they're going to make it. So the project gets underway from the, basically from the very moment they, uh, they leave Earth's orbit. Uh, there are LED lights on the ship to combat the effects of space travel on the human brain and they arrive. Uh, so the, the landing's a little bumpy, but they find for once Springfield is actually an accurate name for a place. <laughs> uh, it's beautiful. It's lush. It's green. There's rivers. There's lakes. Uh, it's temperate. There's plenty of fresh water. Um, but 
what they realize with this bumpy landing is uh, the environment is kind of all they have because a lot of their high-tech equipment was damaged in the landing. Uh, and they have a lot of work to do before the supplies they came with, uh, those initial supplies, run out. Uh, but what our scientists know is that environment is surprisingly powerful for aiding cognition and mental health. So all this, the engineers and the scientists are busy working to repair the tech. They're also prescribing their colonists do things like take long walks through the planet's forests and meadows, uh, meditate by the rivers. Uh, they use the ship's 3D printer to create musical instruments for music and dancing. So beyond just being relaxing and fun, these activities actually reduce depression and the, co the effects of cognitive loss through aging. And they also start to, in the case of Mason's son, uh, start to break down the cues that trigger addiction cravings. So even just upon landing at this world, they, their, their conditions are improving. Once, the, once all their equipment is repaired, though, uh, Project Phoenix really kicks into gear. Uh, those LED ship, uh, the LED lights from the ships uh, have been repurposed to treat mental conditions like depression and to boost cognitive function. Uh, they use non-invasive brain induction, uh, basically creating VR, virtual reality, inside your brain without goggles uh, to treat PTSD. So Eliza's daughter, the veteran, is actually able to break that reinforcement cycle of, of, of trauma and stress. Uh, nanotechnology also comes into play. Um, Eliza actually has been hiding uh, that she has cancer, and what they're able to do is use nanotechnology to trigger the brain's reward center that uh, can target and destroy cancerous tumors. Uh, nanotech also uh, is used to repair the effects of Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative uh, diseases. In the case of Sophie's father, un it unlocks all his memories. He was a farmer. He knows how to uh, how to uh, you know, plant crops. Uh, and other other people on the team are uh, people who know how to build, how to construct, engineer. So now now they have a healthy, motivated population who knows what to do to create a new world for themselves and also how to do it. Uh, the ship has a very powerful computer. Uh, it's full of planetary uh, scans and other useful data about weather um, and, and, and populations. Uh, but there's nothing useful uh, with the computer in terms of analysis and assessment. So the team develops a brain-computer interface that allows a person to access this data, basically becoming a temporary human-computer, supercomputer hybrid that they call the, ana the analyst. And this is a combination of what a computer is good at uh, along with what a human brain is good at. So the, this the analyst allows them to do things like find the right place to settle, um, how to predict the weather, how best to, to rotate uh, the crops they're planting. Uh, and this is a position that is voted on. So Eliza is the first elected analyst. It's not a permanent position, so they want to make sure knowledge and uh, power is, is shared among the community. Uh, they start building their community. One interesting challenge is, uh, is sleep. Uh, Springfield, the planet, is small than Earth, so the day-night cycle is shorter. The scientists develop an auditory program that will play while the colonists are sleeping, which supercharges the brain, so they're actually able to do more uh, with less time. They can do more in five hours sleep than, than we can with nine. Uh, they also end up using technology as a basis for figuring out kind of bumps in the, the social system, the justice system. So one night, everyone gets wakened up because there's a, a violent fist fight between a couple of colonists. Uh, there is a, a man named Lee who is the instigator. He's a guy who was injured earlier in the construction of their um, other town, and he's been getting into a lot of fights. He's a troublemaker. He's been stealing. His, his behavior's escalating. Uh, but once they diagnose him, the neural scan reveals that he actually has uh, da physical damage to his brain from that accident. That's been causing this antisocial behavior. Uh, they were able to catch it early before it got worse, before anyone seriously got hurt. And that is something that, rather than being punished or banished for being someone who's a, a criminal or a violent member of their society, he's actually able to have those brain structures repaired. So he comes back to the community healthy and, and welcomed. So the colony's thriving, and in time a new generation is born. Uh, they're able to use gene editing to make sure that any neurological disorders are not passed on uh, to their children. So people who were predisposed to get Alzheimer's will not have that uh, risk as they, as they get older. And as the colony grows, it starts getting too, uh, when, before it gets too large that the resources are threatened, which obviously is a cause of a lot of strife in the world, um, a subgroup splits off to, f to a new location. And this is where the analyst comes into play again. The analyst helps them decide who will go and where, uh, ensuring a peaceful settlement. So trade and cultural exchange between the towns, uh, network of towns is robust, so everyone learns from everyone else's advancements and discoveries. 
So the founders of Project Phoenix, our, our original, original founders, uh, live very long, full lives. Uh, they stay healthy mentally and physically well past 100 years, unlike their counterparts on Earth. And many generations later, uh, when, the analysts, when the analyst helps them decide that Springfield is basically home to as many people as it can comfortably support, uh, they replicate and improve the ship that brought them here. And now new groups of colonists head out into the galaxy to find new, home, uh, new homes among the stars. One ship, however, actually goes back to Earth uh, to share what they've learned. So the descendants of Sophie, Mason, Eliza, and their ship of you know, Earth's uh, discarded and forgotten come back to Earth to rehabilitate and regenerate their ancestral home. And we see then that Project Phoenix has really lived up to its name, rising from the ashes. I love that. I want to be a Springfieldian. Springfieldian, Springfieldite. Spring, a Springfielder. <laughs> Spring, I like Springfielder. <laughs> Uh, so great, um, yeah, and, I, and you know, I, I love the way, Kira, that you're able to take the story and the hopeful message and all the science that, that, you know, that you guys have been talking about and, and, and build a world that I think we'd all want to be a part of. Yeah, I mean, that, that first conversation we had on, uh, on Monday uh, with the two of them, I was so inspired by all their stories of, of healing and regeneration that it, it, it seemed very natural to tell that story on um, right. this pitch. Right, right. Jess, do you want to give a little more color for, uh, for some of the, the research that went into Kira's pitch? Yeah. Um, so uh, the, one of the first things she was talking about was the light therapy. And um, one of the big problems on the space station or with travel in space at all is that the, the period of night and day is different. Um, for astronauts, they're experiencing a sunrise and a sunset uh, on the space station every, you know... Hour and a half? Yeah, every hour and a half. So it's, it's kind of difficult to uh, set your chronological clock to that and your biological clock. There's more than just sleep cycles that adjust to those, uh, those temporal cues. And so they've changed the light panels in the space station to color-changing ones that will go... Uh, blues tend to indicate daytime, blue and white for daytime, and those in, uh, signal activation in the brain and get you to be awake and alert. And then uh, darker reds, darker lights and reds help cue nighttime. They help trigger melatonin, which is one of the... Mm -hmm. They call it a chronobiotic, which is kind of an interesting term. <laughs> and it helps trigger... Um, the urge to sleep at night and it helps set your clock. So they have them set to, I think Houston time is the one that they get set to. Mm -hmm. uh, and so days, the day starts when Houston time starts, sunrise comes up gradually in the lights uh, and then goes down slowly uh, at night so that they can um, function. In the brain, they, not that long ago, it was uh, 15 years ago, they discovered these, this part of the brain that detected light. It seemed to be light sensitive, but it wasn't receiving receptors from the eyes. Hmm. So they were like, what kind of light is it seeing? And it turned out it was detecting not light per se, like what you look at um, and, and processing what you're seeing, but more like the general overglow of light, the, co the color, the tone, the intensity of it. And that's the suprachiasmatic nucleus that uh, indicates time cues in days and nights. So there's one big thing we could do, and everybody at home can do that too. Um, most of our iPhones or other kind of smartphone have a, a light shift function where you can switch over and it'll start to dial back at sunset of your whatever your natural time is. It'll dial back those, reds, uh, those uh, blues and whites into a red spectrum, so it'll help you fall asleep if you're a person that has trouble falling asleep. Uh, switching your lights over, that kind of helps at the beginning. Um, Let's see, another thing she was talking about was um, getting out in nature and helping um, treat mental illness that way. They found that people who get out and walk even uh, 30 minutes two or three times a week um, is comparable to Prozac for some kinds of depression. Not severe, severe, more biologically oriented depression, but perhaps um, a rough patch in somebody's life, that kind of mild, more mild depression. Um, getting out, exercising for preferably in nature, where you can see trees, where you can see greenery, and, and it's helpful that that planet had some, some greenery there. <laughs> um, and uh, in terms of uh, addiction, you mentioned that uh, some of the people that they were sort of casting out into this mission were addicts. Um, as you can see, all the things I'm talking about, people say, oh, you're a psychopharmacologist, you're going to just talk about drugs, 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 but all of the stuff that I'm talking about is mind-body medicine. It's ways to alter your physiology without actually altering your physiological d uh, movements directly. It's, it's altering it through your environmental choices right. and, your, and your behavioral choices. So for addiction, they've found that your um, body likes to stay at a perfect 
prime operating state we call homeostasis, which is right in the middle of its functioning. If you eat something that boosts your blood sugar, uh, eat a candy bar, your body will dump insulin into the system to get the blood sugar back down. If you exercise and get overheated, then your body will sweat by cooling itself off. Um, it'll do that as in response to drugs as well. Mm. And so it, whatever you're doing to your body through a drug, it's going to mess with it and it wants to counteract that. So we've learned that it's not just the physiological aspects of addiction that are important, it's also the fact that um, certain associative cues related to your addiction get triggered in as well. So if you remember Pavlov's dogs where, you know, ring a bell, feed the dog, ring a bell, feed the dog, well, it's the same thing except it's an environment and the drug, an environment and the drug. And people tend to use drugs in the same environments. It could be a physical environment as in a, a room where you shoot a drug or smoke a drug or friends that you smoke a drug with or, or drink. It could be a bar that you always go to. It could be the fact that you always smoke a cigarette when you're commuting in the car. It could be any of those things. Those associations get paired in with the drug addiction. And treating the drug addiction, I'm, I'm not sort of anti-pharmacology, obviously I'm a pharmacologist, but if we could, as, a, as an adjunct, treat the behavioral aspects of an addiction, perhaps we could also alter the physiology mm -hmm. um, of those things. So if you could break the association between the car and the cigarette smoking, then perhaps somebody wouldn't have the craving to, to smoke a cigarette once they have quit and detoxed. They wouldn't have the craving to smoke a cigarette once they got into that car. Um, and so... So Certainly. What, for, sorry, what yeah, does that ahead. look like? Does that look like having them drive a bunch of times without the cigarette? That's so, exactly it. And so, I mean, it's not going to make a ton of money for some pharmaceutical company. <laughs> but, you know, if, if somebody, uh, I tell the story about uh, a, a true story. It was a group of girls were um, shooting heroin, sadly, in uh, the girls' bathroom. Uh, opiate addiction is rampant. They were shooting heroin in the girls' bathroom before school in high school. And they would always shoot up in the girls' bathroom before class. And if you think about a person's body, the first time they shot up, they probably used a beginner's dose of that drug. They went into that bathroom, they shot up the drug, their body responded to it hugely in the opposite direction, going, oh my gosh, what the heck was that? But in the meantime, she got the largest dose of pure pleasure. This is not an advertisement for heroin, by the way. <laughs> she got the <laughs> largest dose of pleasure that she's going to get from that because the body didn't know how to counteract it. But right. over time, as she uses it day by day, the body gets better at knowing as soon as she walks into that girl's bathroom, that environmental cue says, this is what's about to happen. And the body starts heading in the opposite direction just enough to cancel out some of what she's about to experience. Right. And it's good, but not quite as good. And then over time, it gets not quite as good until the person says, I'm not getting the juice out of it that I used to, which is tolerance, part of tolerance. And so, unfortunately, they don't quit. They end up using more. And so they use more, and then the body gets good at canceling that out, and more and more and more until they end up taking doses that some addicts are, are taking nine times the lethal dose, and they mm -hmm. can survive that just because they're so practiced at it. Um, given that is the case, those cues are really strongly associated. We take people, we clean them up, and then we send them out into their environments full of conditioning landmines, all these places, the person they used to do drugs with, the corner they used to deal drugs, the, and those are triggers for them to relapse. Leaving those triggers behind can certainly help improve the relapse rates. Certainly nothing like leaving your planet <laughs> will guarantee leaving your, all those conditioned cues aside, but if we could, um, if we could do that on a smaller scale and on our own planet, that would help with, with the relapse rates uh, a lot too. And um, the last, things, oh, last couple of things I want to talk about is um, a little bit of pharmacology because you were mentioning uh, drugs. If, there are, if the technology went away when they crashed, they may not have access to all of their pharmaceutical supplies. But if it's a, if it's a planet similar to ours, there might be some natural products that they could use. Um, and I wanted to talk about one aspect of psychopharmacology, which is really interesting, and it's on the forefront, and it is um, uh, psychedelic therapy. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know for a long time in the in the 60s and 70s there was the whole you know the tune in drop out. Um, Timothy Leary got fired from Harvard because he was advocating using psychedelics as therapy. Um, the things like ecstasy, uh, MDMA, have been used in Europe for quite a while for therapy, but in the United States because those things were associated with 
parties and raves and things, those things were banned. But they do have uh, pharmaceutical benefit and therapeutic benefit for sure. Um, they're listed as a Schedule One drug, which means that they're not allowed to, they don't have any medicinal benefit that they could see, but they absolutely have medicinal benefit. benefit. It's taken decades to get the, and it's only been in the last couple of years where a few research studies have come out showing the benefits of hallucinogen therapy. And I wanted to mention a couple of these. I have some numbers here that I didn't memorize because it's kind of new stuff. So currently related to post-traumatic stress disorder. Currently, 850,000 veterans have post-traumatic stress disorder, meet clinical definition. And um, even if we were not in a war situation, we're going to another planet, certainly there are going to be stressors that occur in a trip, a long trip to another planet. Um, this most recent study that's come out, um, they took 26 policemen, firemen, and vets with post-traumatic stress disorder, and they gave them three sessions of ecstasy therapy. All of these hallucinogenic therapies are guided by a therapist. Mm -hmm. So they gave them three sessions, one session a month, um, guided by a therapist to mm -hmm. talk about their issues. After the second of three sessions, uh, two-thirds of them no longer qualified for a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Wow. That's amazing. Um, and they checked in on them after, they did the three sessions anyway, and after the third session, they checked in on them a year later, and the benefits were still there. So it's not like it crept back in. Uh, another study of magic mushrooms, maybe your planet has magic <laughs> mushrooms, um, <laughs> They took um, cancer patients who were very stressed out about, um, about impending mortality, and they gave 80 cancer patients one session of magic mushrooms gu um, guided by a therapist, and they found that 80% of them came out of that one session with an, a significant re reduction in depression and anxiety that was still there six months later. And when they asked, you know, what is it about that experience that helped you, they said that their patient, the patient's trip, they were guided in their trip to go in and confront their cancer personally and um, cancer and, and confront their fear of death and at the end of that they came out feeling better about their life better less stressed and stress is related to your immune system which is related to everything including fighting cancer and so all of those things tie into health and wellness and very few of them are pharmaceutical per se and how just is that changing? I mean, is this research actually creating any change around the, the thoughts around? I think so. This, this research on, on magic mushrooms is sponsored by MAPS, which is a private organization that's been trying to get the government to rethink its position on, on, on these hallucinogenic drugs. And they've had to entirely privately fund all of these studies themselves because it's a Schedule One. it's a legal drug. They can't, the government can't give a grant to study these things because it's technically illegal. So right. perhaps we need to rethink some of that. Right, right. Fascinating. We have toys. <laughs> <laughs> we have toys, we have some toys. Ricardo, um, can you talk to us about the toys? You want to learn about the toys? <laughs> I'm really about curious about it. Um, we'll get to the toys. Yes, so, well, first, so, yes. So, so first of all, you know, it, it's always I've been doing this for the exchange for the National Academies for almost 10 years now, but I feel like every time they work with, with a new entertainment professional, um, a writer like like Harry, it, it's so much fun and it's such an you know such a great experience intellectually and just a lot of fun doing it. Um, having that said, one of the things that I love about the story that, that you created and, and we worked on this time, is that it really touches in very important problems that we have right now. So if you think about it, it's great that we're all getting to live till we're 80 and 90 and, and 100 in some cases, but you know, the generation comes with it. Um, so right now we are facing you know, a high increase of a neurogenerative disorder, so your right. brain is not really keeping up with all this aging process. Right. Right? Right. So then the question becomes, well, what do we do about it? And since we want to go backwards and say, well, let's kill everybody at 30, right? right? <laughs> so what do we do is, is we're trying to really We've look at We've done that in movies. We've done that before, right? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work out so well. No. Um, so, so there's two main sort of approaches that a lot of people in the neuroscience community are working on right now. One is, you know, and, and Jess, you know, definitely tapped to some of this, is looking at it from a well-being perspective, independent of an exact disease or pathology. What can we do to make your brain better? Um, and that means that in some cases, you know, um, delay onset of disorders like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's and, and try to at least push that back mm -hmm. or not make it so suffered so much from it. Um, in other cases, it's really just an education and young kids try to really build up this mental performance and you can do it in many ways. The other side of it, of course, is dealing with the disorders that we already have and having, you know, solutions for pathologies for all these different things. Now, we use all sort of brain imaging tools and cool toys, as you pointed out, to do these things. Um, this is one of the traditional ones. Um, this is an EEG cap. EEG stands for electroencephalography. So this goes in your head if you want to don it, but don't can worry I? about it. <laughs> you can, I mean, feel free. 
all these things, um, so all these are electrodes, and they're basically sensors uh, that would put on that cap, and then this gets connected um, to a big amplifier, the amplifier to a set of computers. You have a technical team to... Beautiful, see? Yeah, Good perfect. Luck. Look, perfect. <laughs> Um, we take about you know, 30 to 45 minutes, what we call capping. Put, all the, so put right. the gel, connect it, you know, right. all the, this cool stuff. And then what you're really looking at is you're looking at brain waves. And what does that mean? And, you know, your cells in your brain are firing um, as they're working. Every time that they fire, they create this electrical energy that gets released. It goes up to your scalp, and we're measuring changes of these electrical fields in your scalp. And we know for quite some time that these changes are associated with different neural networks, so parts of the brain working together on things like attention, memory, language integration, all you know, the good <clears> stuff <throat> that, that makes us humans. So this is sort of the standard you know, for EEG uh, on labs. And you know, uh, like I said, it takes a whole customized thing. We like to call it portable. Uh, but, you know, when it's more than a big fMRI scanner that takes up a whole room. Right. Uh, but it's still, you know, within its constraints. Right. So one of the things that, you know, might be kind of cool for you guys to know as well, and we discussed this a bit, is a lot of the stuff that you're hearing from Kira that might seem too sci-fi-ish, we're actually not that far in some of them. So let me show you guys something. So this is actually brand new. This is where we work on a Neuroverse. So I showed you the cap, you know, connects to a computer and all that stuff. Here's what we've been working on. This thing, we call it the brain station. You can do this one if you like. Um, this one is basically a full-on EEG system and connects to your cell phone, uh, and you can run everything they're running on a normal EEG, so measuring attention, uh, memory, integration, all this kind of stuff. You can just, it's wireless, you just connect it with your cell phone. Because yep, goes right there. Um, is it going to stay on? Or? Well, you have to oh, I have put to the adhesive. Thing. Yeah, anyway. It has like a double tip adhesive if you wanted so to put it on. It's so small. Uh, but basically, you can get it anywhere. And one of the reasons, the motivation for us to do this is we really wanted something that will be portable, that will be part of your everyday life. Because as Jess was, was pointing out, a lot of these things are about integrating you know, brain monitoring and neurofeedback into your daily life. So what we like to do with this? Well, <laughs> one part is monitoring your brain states. And you can do it sitting on your couch or surfing. We are talking about this earlier, or hang gliding. Um, but then the other really interesting thing is using tools like neurofeedback. So at the same time that we're reading your brain waves, we can actually try to modulate it using different stimulation. And in this case, you know, I'm not talking about the electrical currents. People are doing that, and that's neurofeedback as well. We're talking about something much less invasive, like you know, sounds or, or images, or you know, put it in specific environments, like you know, when you do daily life activities. Uh, we've been collaborating with, with all kind of, of different people looking at mindfulness, for instance, uh, with Deepak Chopra, we've been talking to him about now. We're talking to um, the Laureate Brain Research Institute. We have this long um, collaboration looking at um, another tool that is now uh, kind of an interesting intervention called the sensory deprivation chambers or float tanks, sounds better I guess. <laughs> um, so that, that actually puts you in a specific interoceptive state, it's totally non-invasive, um, you lay there in the darkness, no sensory stimuli of any kind, and what it does is your brain becomes in this interoceptive state. We're actually able to read it throughout the float, we're able to record your neural signature doing it, and what that allows us is then afterwards to train you with neural feedback to get back into that state. Um, to do that again, you know, if possible, in the absence of drugs, other kind of solutions. Uh, we're doing this with anxiety disorder patients and with PTSD patients. So this was one of the things that could be an interesting solution in this kind of, of environment. Um, there's all sorts of things that, that we've been doing with, with this, um, as an, and others with these kind of systems. Another interesting one that, that we talked about, it and, and Kira touched on her um, script, uh, was the sleep aspect of it. Um, you heard Jazz talking a little bit about the, the LEDs and changing of the lights and how circadian rhythms really you know, manipulate this thing, which is definitely true. Another thing that we're doing with this, uh, and we're currently already doing it, uh, we're working with um, Walter Reed, so with the Army and, and some special operations uh, on this, is basically reading your brain waves during sleep times. Uh, we can stage them into light sleep, deep sleep, REM, and each one of these stages has its own merits and, and is an obviously important part of your cycle. But as part of deep sleep, there's something called slow wave oscillations period. And what it means is it means your brain in a specific state and it produces these kind of slow waves. We know that that part is absolutely crucial for the recovery of, of your brain and consolidation of memories, etc., throughout sleep. Um, so that only happens in the percent of the time that you're in deep sleep and not throughout all the deep sleep, so just a part of it. So one of the things that we're trying to do when you do it, and that's what we use for the script, through auditory stimulation, so on. 
using specific auditory sounds. We record your brain in real time. When you get to a light sleep, we start pushing this auditory stimulation to push you to deep sleep and keep you on that slow oscillation period for longer time. By doing that, theoretically, the idea, and there's different teams showing reports on this, we're working on this now, the goal of this will be exactly to be able to get the same level of sleep recovery in a much shorter period of time. Wow. So if you can compact so sort of your sleep on steroids, right? <laughs> um, and again, so there's all sort of things that can be done with this. Uh, we discussed quite a bit this idea of augmented cognition with brain-machine interfaces. And, you know, these hybrids, you know, between uh, computer and, and persons. And, and this is something very interesting to me. I've, I've discussed it with many people, both on entertainment and on the science community. This is part of our daily lives is how we do to, to get augmented cognition. And independent of this move towards artificial intelligence is really thinking about what is it that computers really excel at and what does our brain do best? Right. And they're not necessarily the same thing, right? right? So computers really can take a vast number of information, do a quick triage to it. But the decision-making process, we're still extremely good at doing that. And when we try to replicate that computer-wise, we can get certain results, but definitely not the same and we want to be part of that process. So looking at uh, synergies that can, you know, get that going and can promote those kind of approaches, getting what's you know, more powerful on the computers on that, like we're doing on the analyst, right? So there's interesting you know, aspects to it you know, even going on right now. Um, so for instance, uh, Elon Musk, and probably most people have heard about this, right? Start this new company called Neuralink, and the idea is to really promote uh, implantable uh, brain-computer interfaces in the near future. Um, it will be not easy to get there, both scientifically and also to, to pitch to humans what's the value to do something, to actually implement something. Um, that, that's one of the things we're excited about with Neuroverse is try to bridge that because there's definitely a lot of gain to be had to have these brain interfaces um, that can help in all sorts of things. Uh, but you want to create that value in society through time and then you know, look at it from an implementable perspective if it makes sense to do so. Um, but also you know, another project that I think is fascinating, even though it's not BCI, per se, but it's part of drove me to, to suggest this when, when we had our meeting, um, was work done by Patrick Sushyang at Dantworks, where he's really looking at, well, his main goal is to solve cancer, but he's doing this by really combining information, creating new correlations. So what he's doing is creating this large network with fiber optic, get all sort of information from genomics to physiological measures from each person to different pharmacological approaches, right? And really try to find correlations of things that are not necessarily how you would think about treating this cancer or this disease, mm -hmm. but by amassing this tremendous amount of information, triaging and correlating it, find new possibilities of treatments. Now, if you think about that and, and you know, project that into this sort of brain interface of the future, that could be an extremely powerful tool, right? If we can at the same time get information from geopositioning systems, physiological systems, all of that, and integrate that quickly, into, into an, an actionable tool like the analyst, I think will be incredibly powerful. So kind of take home message. Uh, there's a lot of really exciting stuff going on. Obviously, we take it to the next level with, with Kira's story, but, but you know, check it out. And you know, we'll also talk a bit about the VR mm -hmm. aspect to it. Uh, if you're curious to check this out, we actually have our system on VR at the Comic-Con. Uh, center, I believe, is Mezzanine Room 17B on San Diego land, so you can go and try it out with a VR system where you can control the whole environment just by using neurofeedback, by calming yourself and, and controlling that, but there, there's a lot of exciting stuff on the works right now. Well, and that's, I mean, that's what I found so fascinating. I mean, Kira, obviously, you know, when you were thinking about how this pitch should come together and what the world would look like, you know, you set it pretty far in the future, mm -hmm. but can you guys talk a little bit about how much of what went into your pitch, you know, in terms of, you know, practical applications of, you know, the specific ideas in terms of the specific characters is actually, you know, within our reach or, or doable at this point in time? I mean, you, you, sure. the analyst, for example, mm -hmm. like w how far away are we from having that kind of connection where we can actually both, uh, both have that data access and also as right. you know, on the human side be able to... So I'll give an example that will be sort of maybe a little bit like the analyst that can be done right now. So, you know, with EEG, you know, being our system or any other system, um, there's, like I said, you can, you can measure different cognitive tasks and different things. One of the things you can measure is attention, modulations of attention, right? right. So here's something that, you know, we are very good at, analysts are very good about doing. Um, so NSA, so National Security Agency specialists, spend their lives training to look at satellite imagery, mm -hmm. right? 
day in, day out, and looking at, you know, from different angles, different perspectives, to find out, you know, let's say, for instance, you know, nuclear facilities, right, all around the world or in countries that you consider that are dangerous or you have some concerns about. So these guys go and triage to literally thousands of these images per day. They got very good at doing it, but it still takes time, right? So what you can do, and we know how it works, is basically when you're observing that, your brain first takes a visual pass of the picture. If it gets to something that really, you know, calls your attention, you have this spike on this, what we call an evoked potential, uh, which is this brain modulation for attention. You reorient your attention to that thing, and then, you know, they'll make a decision and say, oh yeah, this looks like a nuclear facility, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. So what it can be done already is you can sort of kind of hack into that. So here's what I mean. Instead of these guys taking, you know, five minutes per image, right, and going through it, what they do is very rapidly showing them rapid presentation of images while EG is being read and looking for those spikes. The images where you get those spikes get put in a different folder, you separate to that one, and then you spend more time with those images which probably have something in there. Because we're very good about, you know, detection even before you become aware of it right. in mo many of these things. The other thing, of course, you can do is, is do with, with computer sciences and, and um, visual computer sciences create algorithms on the computers, you know, to detect those things. But funny enough, not so easy, because when you get all these different angles and shadows, there's so many variables in a lot of these things. Right. And your brain is fantastic when you get trained to do that. Right. You can say the same thing about, you know, when you're a radiologist or any radiologist, really, looking at, you know, MRI scans or CAT scans and have ways to integrate that. So now if you can get work that is being done, you know, in the course of seven hours, up to three by taking advantage of something like that, you know, that's, you know, one step closer to the analyst, I would say. Right. And Jess, would you say same thing about uh, you know aspects of of the of the pitch in terms of you know using the environment or? I'm I'm happy to see like when I went when I went to grad school <clears throat> a number of years ago um, to talk about mind body medicine was you know you, you were kind of crossing this invisible line and in, in our psychology department the downstairs was all clinical psychology and the upstairs was all biological psychology and the floors almost never spoke to each other or crossed over at all right. and you know and, and you take a class in the downstairs classrooms or the upstairs classroom and they say well you know in the biology floor, they talk about how this is all your chemicals and that's all it is. And then the other ones would say, oh, well, downstairs, they would say it's all talking about your mother. But, um, <laughs> but in reality, I, I knew that there was more connection between those as possible, but it, it <clears throat> still really wasn't a popular idea. But now you're starting to see uh, cross-disciplinary, this, this line between your, your body, like your body is a real thing and your mind is this all in, all in your head. Like, why did that become a phrase of, of representing imaginary? Nobody says, oh, it's all in your liver. You know, like, it's a, it's a real part of your body. Um, the fact that they're connected and now we're starting to see things like uh, sleep, it relates to your immune system and your immune system helps uh, uh, fight cancer, immune, immunotherapies. We're seeing sleep helps, um, helps clear out beta amyloid protein, f which contributes to Alzheimer's disease. And now we're like, wow, you can just alter physical body by getting more sleep, by taking walks in nature, by um, removing yourself from the environments where a traumatic thing happened, or maybe disconnecting yourself from those things. It, sometimes, one of the other things that I'm seeing coming out is um, to try to head off a disorder behaviorally before it even kicks in. So one of the studies that they were doing was going into a place where like a tornado had rolled through and where a high number of people would likely get some sort of post-traumatic stress um, out of that. They don't know who in advance is going to develop post-traumatic stress as a result of experiment, experience and who won't. So if they give those people a, uh, a beta blocking drug, a stress blocking drug for just 48 hours after the event happens to keep them from reprocessing that trauma because we tend to revisit, oh my gosh, that just happened, oh my gosh, that just happened. And every time we do that, a little jolt of you know, amygdala limbic system activity kind of juices up that memory and then it can get locked in. If we can prevent that rehashing from happening really early, maybe the disorder won't even set in. So I'm loving how much I'm seeing almost every day Scientific American feed or my news feed is just full of mind-body medicine and that makes me very happy. So are we already doing that with soldiers that are coming back from war? I mean... We're, we're starting to get there. I mean, these studies with, with MAPS, um, these studies with... Uh, that's an organization that works on uh, hallucinogenic psychedelic therapy. These studies... Europe's been doing this stuff for ages. They say that one session of couples therapy on ecstasy... Now, this is not use it on your own and let your, your buddy who's a, a psychic trip advisor, you know, <laughs> let you guide you through. This is, this is tr guided by trained people. 
But uh, one, one couple's therapy on ecstasy is the equivalent of, they say, about six months of traditional couple's therapy because on a small dose of pharmaceutically pure ecstasy under the guidance of a therapist, you drop your walls, you get back to the original loving feelings, you're more empathetic to the other person, and you just sort of get right to the meat of the situation sooner without having to break down all those walls. Europe's known this for a while. We just have to get past that. And I am not advocating, you know, dropping the war on drugs and everything. The opiate problem is a huge problem. I'm under the impression that we should use evidence-based science to guide some of these do have pharmaceutical therapeutic potential and we shouldn't just ban all of it outright just because it happens to be used at a, at a rave or in a you know, club situation. Right. And if we can find ways to increase the efficacy of these drugs, right? And, and reduce yes. you know, some interesting <laughs> stuff you know, with, with VR and neurofeedback right now. There's different studies looking at burn victims or cancer patients and looking at you know, pain management now with the opioid crisis yeah. and the deal. And, and it's not like like, you know, we're going to use VR to replace the opioids altogether. Mm -hmm. But if you can reduce the dose of an opioid and produce a similar analgesic, so a similar painkiller effect by combining with it VR, and now we dropped, you know, 20, 30 percent on the dose that you're taking, you know, that's incredibly powerful. It's not solving the problem per se, but, but it's a really significant contribution. And we're seeing that, you know, all over the, the different kind of, of studies and things that, that we can do. We have this study that we're very excited about it when it's looking at migraine, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, you know, it's not going to solve migraine but what we're able to do with our system is recognize an upcoming migraine attack 24 hours before you even start having any symptoms. That's amazing. So by doing that, right, any kind of tryptin drugs that are usually used for migraine, you can do it very <laughs> early in the process. And what it enables you is, one, to sometimes really abort the crisis altogether, or at least to reduce the severity and the length of the migraine crisis. And, you know, migraine, we're talking about 14% of the world population, right. 36 million Americans alone in this, and it's incredibly debilitating. And it's, crip yeah, it's crippling, right? Right? Exactly. And so we lose, people lose work productivity. People mm -hmm. lose, you know, the it's, it's the people change their patterns of living in order yeah. to avoid them. It's it's incredibly debilitating. You know, I, I, you know, until we actually start working on this years ago, I you know was not a clinical population I was very familiar with, and I've been surprised. I mean, patients come to us and even just saying. Even just the fact of knowing that it's coming, just allowing us to, you know, reorganize, replan the next day, avoid stressors, you know, do that, that's already huge. And of course, if you combine that with increased treatment efficacy, then it's, it, it's a really big deal. And you're right, it affects productivity. It affects, you know, it's interesting. A paper just came out two years ago. Um, migraine patients have about three times the level of comorbidity of generalized anxiety disorders, which they develop because, of course, they're permanently in this stage of being afraid of getting a migraine. Right. Um, so, so, yeah, all this things. I think that having this multidisciplinary approach, you know, bringing things like, you know, mindfulness, uh, bringing, you know, specific types of therapy like hallucinogenics, bringing down what, you know, Justin Feinstein is doing at Laureate Brain Research Institute with the float clinics and bringing, you know, floating as a way, you know, for intraceptiveness, for PTSD, for, you know, all these things, it, it, they need to have a multidisciplinary approach in my view. And I think we can learn a lot by integrating all these different knowledge. Right. I think a lot of this is a move toward individual medicine. We're moving towards, right. you know, this <clears throat> chemotherapy combination works best for you, but not for you and yeah, not right. for you. This psychological treatment, this environmental medicine, if we're going to open up all of the environment and not say this pill will cure you, but right. this combination of things, to use Ricardo's stuff to figure out exactly which combination is actually working in you, and then say, okay, for you, it's walking tends to work, in nature tends to work, but for you, it might be meditation, and for someone else, it's yoga, and for someone else, it's this. It's all mind-body mind medicine, but we need to figure out exactly what works for each particular person. It's not going to be a one-size-fits-all for everybody. Yeah, I agree 100%. As, as, yeah. as human beings, we're, you know, the idea of the, the universal cure-all, the panacea is very attractive. Um, what what are the risks of pseudoscience? I mean, people are desperate for a cures, lot. for therapies, <laughs> for themselves, for loved ones. Um, a lot of things you're talking about, I mean, it's evidence-based science. There's, there are a lot of things out there that claim to be these therapies and cures that people are making a lot of money and you know, causing a lot of harm. What, how can people uh, guard against pseudoscience? How can they tell the real science from the... You know, that, that's a great question. And, and unfortunately, there is a lot, a lot out there to be careful about. Um, and it, it's tricky, right? Because, you know, for the general public, it can really tell the difference. Um, and in some cases, you know, the, your placebo pill looks just like, you know, your drug. And you trust someone like the FDA to tell, oh, this is a good one. This is just, you know, a placebo pill. But in other cases, with these alternative kind of medicines, you know, it's, it's tricky. Um, there was, you know, issues a couple of years ago that, that were brought up by different companies doing this mind training and neural training games, right? And the idea is that if you use specific structures um, onto, you know, push your mind in specific games, you could train attention, memory, etc., right? And 
in some cases you can actually develop neural plasticity. So in other words, your brain can actually change to accommodate, right. Right. you know, this, this new thing. And with that, it develops, you know, it strengthens your cognitive abilities. The problem is just like in pills, not every pill is the same pill. Mm -hmm. And games that kind of look like it doesn't mean that they're necessarily working. And, you know, you, you take something that you did in the lab in very specific conditions, and then you put it, you know, into society. And now you have, you know, 50 different games spawning out of that. Well, very specific things like, you know, in some movement playing game, the time that each you know, agent is on screen, the, the interval between two agents, all those things are very, very important. And they're just like you know, fine-tuned ingredients in pharmacology in a pill. So you really need to, so I'll say two things, right? So obviously you want to be responsible if you're in a company. Unfortunately, a lot of people are just there to make money. Um, there's great examples. Um, Achille Labs is a company that was spin off of uh, UCSF, of Adam Ghazali's lab. And they've been doing all the right things. They got through FDA approval now and they have a game to help treating ADHD in kids, which is fantastic. But if you're going through all the process, you know, FDA approval right now, you know, to, to get through the game like we're doing for migraine and other things. I would say, look, and, and it's not easy, but if any company is telling like, oh, we can do this, you can do that, ask for scientific publications, mm -hmm. right? Ask for peer-reviewed papers, ask for presentations in Congress, in scientific congresses, versus, you know, just some guy who's doing it. And, and look at their scientific team, right? Make sure that when you look at the cool core management team of the company, is not, you know, 10 marketing guys, a designer, <laughs> uh, and three biz dev guys, and then there's some guy that study I don't know, neurosciences on his bachelor's. You know, <laughs> you don't want that, right? You need to have a strong scientific team, you know, at the head of the company. And then you need to, you know, still really look for a track record for whatever it is that they're saying they're doing. Whatever the intervention might be, you need to have professionals from that in that. And you need to have some kind of scientific track record. And for us in sciences, that means presentation in conferences, and that means peer-reviewed papers. Mm -hmm. If they got that and they go through that process, it can still fail. I mean, we're all humans, but at least you know that they're going to do the right things. If they're basically something that they spun out in six months with no evidence-based things, but then they say, oh yeah, this is proven because in the lab, but not their lab, someone else's lab five years ago with a different thing did, well, then, then I would definitely advise for caution there. So Kira, how do you, so there's obviously a challenge. I mean, I love the fact that the, the topics that we're covering today and this year uh, are all about saving the world and making the world a better place and and uh and i think that's really fun what's the challenge for you in in using all this great science to to inform your storytelling and particularly when it comes around you know comes to like creating a story around a utopian society yeah it's uh uh well the, the first hardest thing was just narrowing down on a few things because I've learned so much just from talking to these we guys. Hit her with so oh much no, it's so great! And I, 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 I oh, love I science. I love sci-fi. I've worked in science fiction pretty much my whole career. Right. Um, and I just, I'm a bit of a science nerd. I, I just love this as, as a layperson. So there was so much to choose from. Um, but I was really moved by, as I said earlier, their their stories of of healing and regeneration and. I was interested in telling this particular story, not just to be the save the world thing, but um, uh, people who are struggling with different types of physical and mental conditions, because often, uh, I think I'm concerned about the, the te technology gap. So um, a lot of the work that is, uh, is being done is funded by the government, it's for the military. Um, longevity is very popular as a topic among certain Silicon Valley billionaires. You yep. know, there, there's a real risk of the, all these advancements going to the haves, not the have-nots. Right. So I was interested in telling a story, sort of saying, look, technology should be for everybody's benefit. And actually, that's a question I would have for you guys, is like, how, how, how can we uh, close that technology gap? Sometimes it's market forces. So remember how big and expensive cell phones used to be, and now everyone has one. Electric cars have been a lot more affordable. Um, how do we keep, when, especially when it gets to things like longevity and like physical health and mental well-being, how do we keep that striation from becoming too extreme? I think that's why I like behavioral medicine because it's something that anybody can do no matter where they are. Right. You know, you don't need a smartphone. You don't need a, a elite hospital within a few blocks of you. You only need to get out in nature or walk or uh, experience time with friends or, you know, social interaction or to break your environmental cues. You can do all those things for free wherever you are. Yeah. And that's why, like, Oprah's campaign to get people walking, all that stuff was so yeah. successful, right? I mean, you know, it didn't, it didn't require, uh, you know, millions, a gym millions of dollars or, or a gym membership even, right? Yeah. It just, yes. It's just getting people up and moving. 
Um, yeah, I think doing that, I think creating alternatives, right, that you can use, you know, easily. I think even on the technology-wise, if there's something that is actually a value, but you can do it at a really lower cost, mm -hmm. and you can make it accessible to everyone. And again, it's not for that one billionaire that wants to save himself, not the right. world, mm -hmm. but it's really about creating disruptive things. And, you know, one of the things to be disruptive, and just touch upon this very well, is, is one, it needs to be personalized right now. You know, mm -hmm. any kind of medicine or treatment, it needs to be really targeted to that. And what it means is that, well, then it means that it needs to be low cost. It needs to be usable everywhere. It needs to be intuitive. It's not going to be, you know, that you need to train for six months to using it because nobody's going to do it. And it needs to be interesting enough to keep people using it. If it's just a one case scenario, if you really need it because you suffer from a pathology, you're going to do it, like a migraine. But if not, you know, on well-being, you know, we all know going to the gym is great for us. And we all get gyms memberships if we can afford it. But then how many times we actually go to the gym? <laughs> That's a different thing, right? right? So you need to create it in a way that gets weaved into society and becomes part of your normal behavioral pattern to do these things and promote these things. And, and you're right, it can't be you know, for some elite. It needs to be something that can really translate, I think. But that's also where our partnership comes in, right? I right. mean, that's where you know, the opportunity that the, the Science and Entertainment Exchange Absolutely. offers to, to have us in the entertainment community take the storytelling that we're doing and, and, and inform it with all the science that you guys are, yeah. are, are working on can help get that information out to a broader I think broader it is, is a tremendous service, you right. know, because one of the things is by, you know, integrating in narratives, just like Kira did, it's very different. Well, first of all, it's, it's projection. We'll talk about it in a second. But one thing is very different for us to talk about a disease in abstract or a problem in abstract right. or actually associate with a character that people actually care about. Right. If you use the character as a vehicle for, you know, whatever concern or promotion you want to do, it's a hundred times more efficient, right? Because now they actually relate to it versus right. just this abstract notion of something, right? And then the other thing, of course, is just, you know, it's just a platform, how many people it reaches, right? We've been, you know, I'll give an example. Five or six years ago at Comic-Con, I got asked uh, with, with David Salzberg and the team from the Big Bang Theory, I had just actually presented two posters on the Society for Neurosciences meeting mm -hmm. uh, on some of the research that we've <laughs> did, right? And, you know, it's for science purposes, a very big meeting is about, you know, 39,000 people. So, you know, for a conference, it's pretty big for us. And, um, and they asked me to do some consults for them and then they wanted to do some stage dressing. So, you know, they asked me for the posters and they put it on, you know, um, Amy's laboratory, the neurosciences laboratory. Right. And one of the episodes, they have, you know, the character Sheldon and Amy having this dialogue and the posters is right behind it, right? I get so many emails, <laughs> calls, right? And I'll guarantee you that, you know, nine or 10 million people watched that episode. It was the most ever seen scientific poster from SFN, right? right. I mean, it, it's things like this. And if we can, you know, work together, and, and especially, and I think this is something that, you know, I learned throughout the years, I know that Jess did as well, and we all do it, is when we work together, it's not about, you know, working with writers about, oh, this is wrong, don't do that, or you can't do that. It's not about being a referee, right? right. It's really about working together to figure out what is right for the narrative and for the story and not make you know the science and the story competing but instead actually making inform each other right. and making it richer in every way being characters being you know the dramatic arc being whatever it might be and if you do that some of the information that we can put in there you know is fantastic we we're talking earlier about you know how we started you know, one of my first uh, gigs on consulting many many years ago uh, was on French with JJ right. Abrams uh, Alex Kurtzman Bob Warsi and in one of the episodes, and we went through a lot of things, but one of the episodes that I wanted to do some mind control. And, um, and of course, they go for the traditional thing. Oh, we're going to hypnotize people. Mm. It's like, oh my God. You know, <laughs> my two biggest beefs are always like, we only use 10% of your brain. No, if you do that, you're dead. And B, we're going to hypnotize people, right? right? To make them do things. Uh -huh. Well, here's the thing. You can't do that. Hypnosis only works as a voluntary process. Right. The person actually needs to agree with you and go through the process for that to work. Right. So that, that's a deal breaker right there, but you keep seeing this thing done. So they came with me to that and I said, don't do that, please. <laughs> you know, let, let's find an alternative. So we work with TMS and other ways to control brain and cause disruption, whatever. But then in the beginning of the show, there's this thing, um, someone dies and you know, the cops come in and one of the characters um, comes in and, you know, and, and, and the cops are saying, well, you know, this guy jumped you know, off a, you know, a building, whatever. You know, I think his mind control is probably hypnosis. And one of the main characters on Fringe on the show goes like, no, you know, that can't work because hypnosis needs to be voluntary. So, and I said, you know, you just make my whole season. <laughs> that just was by that one thing, you make my whole that. season. That was right? you that fixed that. I love yeah, that. I appreciated it's, that. It's beautiful. Anything that you can do like that, I yep. do think it, it, it's a big value on, on yep. promoting. Well, and, and so, I mean, let's have a quick conversation about how 
how we take our story of our Spring, Springfieldians and actually make it, right? Yeah, yeah, so Project Phoenix, you know, yep. but uh, actually making it. Well, uh, so it's interesting, and thinking about would this be, could this be a movie, could this be a TV show? Um, I did craft it so it had an ending, um, but it's also covering a lot of, a fairly significant span of time, so maybe a limited series would be a good kind of model for it. Well, and I'll be the producer for a second. Okay. Because, I mean, I think the thing that's interesting to me about these stories, and particularly the challenge of telling stories about utopian societies, is that part of what allows us to engage in storytelling is to engage in conflict, right? And you were, had a specific uh, set of parameters, but when I heard your pitch for the first time, I actually jumped forward, because to, to me, the plot point that I think would be the interesting starting place is to see... Operation Phoenix having gone out in the world and then Coming. now they've come back to Earth, right. right? And so what is that going to look like when you've got now a generation has gone by, we've sent what we thought were our misfits and cast-offs out into space thinking that we would never hear from them again and that they would die off because how could this, how could this community survive and thrive? But now they come back and they're healed and they're offering this message of hope. How's that going to be received? How do you... Mm -hmm. what, what kind of world are they going to come back to? And so to me, what I think is interesting would be taking the narrative that you've wove, woven thus far as a backstory and then engaging with those characters you've created that are so great in a narrative around the conflict that they would encounter on Earth and the, and the need. And, and I think it can still be an incredibly positive story because you can see their triumph as they fight the forces that exist on Earth in order to save it. Mm -hmm. um, that... That could be a movie. Yeah, ab it absolutely could. Uh, yeah, I, I could see, oh, also it could be season two of, of a TV show. I mean, the, the yep. interesting thing is that with, with, a, with a TV show, you know, you invest in characters and relationships, and if you're telling a multi-generational story, um, you know, unless people are kind of hyper-annuated, which is a way to play it, um, you kind of lose some of your core characters, you know, midway through the first season. So your, your, your idea of, like, maybe that's, you know, maybe the... It's a two-hour pilot where you kind of tell basically a lot of what I described, right. and then you do send them back. Because that is interesting. I mean, you have these people coming back who are, you know, depending on how much the gene editing happened, is like they're kind of superhuman. Exactly. I mean, they're they're cognitively right. much more robust than uh, you know. They're they're living longer. They're healthier. Um, they're kind of superhuman and. Uh, again, again, if they've, uh, you know, if they, if they through choice or uh, or genetic engineering, are like built to be more empathetic, whatever. Like, there's lots of different stories that they would run into with people who are kind of behind them in terms of of that cognitive uh, and enhancement. Right. Right. Well, and then, look, there's, it's not just about film and television. I mean, I think the colony story in and of itself would make a fascinating game, right? You can do a, a resource-based game where you're talking about, you know, that group of people and, and, and the limitations that they have when you leave and then trying to guide them through that process of, of creating that, that utopian society with the tools that they have, a crashed ship, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, you know the, the equipment's destroyed. I would definitely be playing that game. Well, in the game, you could even have actually the sensors to, to force you to actually use mm. brain control oh, nice. over different. Yep. Now we're doing yeah. something oh, fun. Oh, I like fun, that. Right? Yeah. So as you as you, as you're as you're training your colonists to uh, right. do mind body medicine and, and you know meditate by the river, you right. yourselves are you're, you're actually using it and doing it. it. Right. Yeah. Like could you do that. like if you do like a pilot like that, and then using your idea of coming back to Earth? Could you do some flashbacks? Then you know, I love that idea. Back to that. That's so great. You, you plan it with a pilot, you frame it that way, and then is they're back to Earth, and you want to point out some specific thing how they got there. Just do some flashbacks. Absolutely, and that that's a really good point. And that's a way also to keep alive characters who may not have you know lived past a certain point in the season. Is right. you can actually flash back and do that. Yeah, I, uh, I, 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 the idea of using the uh, the, the colony as a game, I think, is really. Is really great because that, that's that I find is uh, I, I love colony stories, you know, settling stories, frontier stories because it, it's especially with outer space or um, interesting environments. It's kind of a cool what if kind of thing, um, but I, but making it interactive with the game, I, I think it's a super cool idea. Yep, definitely. Well, and and if you can do it where you can combine that story in a serialized format and have all the interactivity, of the gameplay with it, then you know, then you have that that extra level of engagement where people are identifying with the characters in the game and they're having an opportunity to play at the same time. So, right. Right. so I bought it. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's very cool. And then so in that situation then, you know, Jess, you know, so we've come up with this idea. How do you how do you how do we work with typically you guys? engage? Yeah. So typically people would call the science exchange and anybody with a science question who's working on a book or a screenplay or anything can call up and get uh, connected with a scientist working in that field uh, for free, and they will consult with you and help um, as a service to the National Academy of Sciences so that they can help get 
the science out there, both to educate the public, to improve public understanding and, and perhaps grants and perhaps, you know, it's, it's a good service. But they would call, get connected, and then you just, you, 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 sometimes we go for coffee, uh, we meet for lunch or something like that, or sometimes we just talk over email or phone and they would just um, ask their questions and we would help them out, not to correct what they need to do, but to figure out how scientifically, um, I call it plausible-ish, to make it plausible-ish, mm -hmm. just to get enough science in there so that they can get where they want to go. Because it's, it's their job to get where they want to go. Right. And we're there to serve their vision, not them to turn their vision into a dissertation. You know? Well, and we appreciate that because <laughs> yeah, it does a, make our stories better. Yeah, it's a fantastic service. I, I, I'm working with a couple of scientists through the exchange on a screenplay that I'm working on, very different idea than this one. Um, and it's been exactly that. It's been this, this great kind of uh, ongoing conversation. They understand what I'm trying to do. I understand what they're trying to do. And it just makes the story better. Well, thank you guys for joining us on the Gamma Ray live stream. Appreciate it. And, uh, you know, thank you everyone who's, uh, who's been watching. Thanks, everyone. Bye.